got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like psycho peach, if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, um, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today's, um, this is a little bit different. I actually went on a journey to interview some of the top direct response marketers and copywriters on the planet. And I accumulated um, some really amazing people. And so what you're about to listen to is, um, has been recorded a little bit ago on my path to uncover some of the um, the people who are really well known and people who aren't who are behind the scenes and not known at all, but are powerhouses in the direct response industry. So um, listen up, and before I get to that interview, um, I just want to let you know this episode is brought to you by Rise Twenty Five, which I co-founded with my business partner John Corcoran. And at Rise Twenty Five, we help B two B businesses connect to their dream. 100 clients, referral partners, strategic partners, and actually help you run your podcast so it generates um, return on investment ROI. And, you know, for me, podcasting is, is much more personal. And it's not just about business because I was inspired to start podcasting by my grandfather who was actually a Holocaust survivor. And he and his brother were in the concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and they were the only members of their family to survive. But um, he, he's not alive anymore, but his words and legacy live on because of the interview the Holocaust Foundation did with him. And that is on my about page on Inspired Insider. You can watch it. Um, I watch it multiple times a year just reminding, you know, to remind me of how grateful I am and appreciative I am for the things I have that I didn't have to go through because he actually survived and lived on. Um, but um, his legacy lives on because of that interview. And so, yes, podcasting will help your business, but it helps you and your guests leave a legacy of knowledge. And I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life outside of meeting my wife because of all the amazing relationships. So, you know, our clients range from a Berkshire Hathaway company to agencies to lawyers to consultants to Harvard alumni um, entrepreneur group uh, to many more so if you I believe you have a business you, sh you should have a podcast period uh, you have questions about starting a podcast um, or you've thought about it do it but you can add, you could email us at support at rise 25 media.com learn more at rise 25.com and uh, on to the interview. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of inspiredinsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Don Hauptman, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Many of the top copywriters speak the world of Don in his over 30 year career. Don is an award-winning direct response copywriter. He's retired a few years ago, but still speaks and writes on marketing, and he's created many successful direct mail packages and renewal campaigns, some of which we'll talk about today. He is a 10-time winner of the annual Newsletter on Newsletters Promotion Award for the subscription acquisition packages he created, and for decades, no other writer could match that record. Don may be best known for his headline, Speak Spanish Like a Diplomat. And he'll, we'll talk about some of the other headlines he likes. This familiar series of ads has sold spectacular numbers of recorded foreign language lessons in generating revenues that total in the tens of millions of dollars. His work is mentioned in three major college advertising textbooks, and examples of his promotions are cited in Million Dollar Mailings and the World's Greatest Direct Mail Sales Letters. He's also the author of The Versatile Freelancer, which shows self-employed professionals how they can diversify into public speaking, training, consulting, and critiquing. And I'll tell you where you can find that at the end. Don, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Jeremy. I'm glad to be here. It's fantastic. And I'm glad you're spending the time. And I want us to start with telling our audience something about your career and the types of clients and products you've worked for. Well, I had a specialty throughout my almost 
throughout the entire length of my career, I specialized in marketing information, and my clients were publishers of newsletters, magazines, books, seminars, conferences, spoken word, audio products, uh, both business to business and consumer, and in the consumer area, most newsletters are either investment financial or health. I wrote the copy to generate sales, in the case of periodicals, those that meant uh, subscriptions and renewals. And even though I was in this kind of niche, it's a pretty broad niche. So I think the lessons I learned will be applicable to your viewers, no matter what field they're in or what products mm -hmm. they're selling. Okay. So tell me, what were some of the biggest successes that you had? Well, as you mentioned, I'll probably be forever remembered for those language ads, speak Spanish like a diplomat. Those were enormously uh, successful. Uh, and that was an anomaly because mostly I didn't do space ads or coupon ads. Uh, the publications and products I worked for had to be sold through direct mail. Mm -hmm. So uh, one good example early in my career was for a financial publication called The Retirement Letter. And the teaser copy on the outside of the envelope said, Is Social Security Doomed? Uh, classic fear approach. Uh, for a mutual fund newsletter, I came up with the headline, if you're out of the market now, you'll hate yourself later. And that ran for years and years. Um, for a newsletter called The Organized Executive for Managers, uh, we said, um, um, uh, here's how the most successful executives in America get so much done in so little time. And one last example for a newsletter called Tax Angles on um, cutting your tax bill. Uh, the teaser I came up with was um, uh, if you're counting on your tax advisor to help you cut your taxes, you're making the most expensive mistake of your life. So those are five or so examples of the kinds of things that I did that were achieved a certain measure of success. So tell me, I want to ask you about Speak Spanish Like a Diplomat, and tell me a little bit about how long did it take you to come up with that headline? Well, it took me about zero seconds because the platform was handed to me on a platter. Uh, this was my first client and mentor, Bob Kephart, who founded what's now KCI Communications, still a successful uh, publishing firm uh, in the investment area. And he had uh, somehow found out that the uh, Foreign Service Institute, uh, the Department of State, was putting out these language lessons. And uh, I, at the time, apparently, you couldn't copyright government-created things because the philosophy was it all b belonged to the taxpayers who paid for it. So he just remastered the tapes, ordered the manuals, the printed books from the government printing office, and then we resold them. And because they were created to teach diplomats and foreign service personnel, mm. I just came up with Speak Spanish Like a Diplomat. It was the easiest headline I ever wrote. Because I was reading one of your articles and it said, you know, you don't want to do boring type headlines. It said, you gave the example of Speak Spanish Like a Native... Boring, well, yes, speak if, Spanish like a, yeah, so, if, if it had been speak Spanish like a native, uh, you wouldn't have had that curiosity element. I right. think people looking at it said, why diplomat? And so that the headline gets you to read the first sentence and the right. first sentence gets you to read the second sentence. And right. before you know it, the guy is writing a check or charging his credit card. Right. So, and Don, so you mentioned the diplomat, the retirement letter, organized executive tax angles. Tell us a little bit about why these campaigns worked. What were some of the lessons you drew that can help others? Well, I think two words kind of sum it up, and that's big idea. There's a big, unique selling proposition in each of those headlines and envelope teasers. You're targeting the prospect's needs, his problems, his concerns, and that's really where you want to go. You want to drill into the pain point or the otherwise insoluble problem that this guy has and then say here's an easy inexpensive way to solve it and all this has to be achieved by a creative process first at least in my case because I dealt with so many information products you do a whole lot of reading you take notes you mark things up and then after you've done the that research stage you go through it all a second time and you say what can we use what's really surprising uh, what is counterintuitive. Uh, what is it that can really benefit the reader? And you translate the benefits of the, the products 
uh, benefits and advantages and selling points into persuasive copy. Mm -hmm. And it all sounds like a formula, um, but uh, there is a lot of creativity involved in it. And when you get it right, and all the, I sometimes compare it to a, a Broadway show, if all the elements are right, then you have a hit. Yeah, yeah. So do they come back after you're done with some of those you know, when the, the, the mailing goes out or wherever it goes, do they tell you the metrics and the success or they just say it was the winner and we're going to run it again? Well, here, because I'm retired, I have to think back over 30, 40 years, uh, most clients shared their results with me. There were a few that were paranoid and they wouldn't want any, any number getting out, not even to the copywriter. But it certainly helped me to learn uh, not only, yes, it worked or it beat the control, our pre-existing package, but to know exactly the numbers. And uh, especially helpful was to see a spreadsheet. At that time, they were done literally by, by hand on pieces of paper. Um, and it would show every list that was mailed. Usually, you'd mail 6, 12, 15 mailing lists. And you'd see exactly how, how much was spent, how much came back. And of course, in direct marketing, as so many of your viewers know, we are accountable. We know things down to the penny, which is not the case when a billboard says drink Coca-Cola and you never know. Uh, the right. Coca-Cola people will never know whether that billboard paid its own way because there's just no way to track the sales. But uh, I certainly appreciated it when the client uh, shared with me the metrics and the results and that in turn helped me help him. Uh, I, it helped me help the client when I because I could say, oh, if these two lists work, maybe you should go out and rent another list like it. And I often gave that sort of advice beyond simply the copywriting. Yeah, so Don, for Learn Spanish Like a Diplomat, will you talk about, for people who don't know, how did, what format did it go out in? How did people receive it? Well, I could have, um, uh, your, your approach here is not to use visual aids, but of course I could have um, uh, shown the ad. If you Google it, it may turn up. These were, uh, oddly enough, I don't think we ever did direct mail for these tapes. It was entirely... Uh, what we called space ads, which means ads in magazines and newspapers with a coupon, although in this case the whole ad was the coupon because it had a heavy broken rule around it. And uh, we found that in-flight magazines worked pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, we discovered that most of the customers, at least we thought or intuited, were business people. They needed to learn Spanish for their work. These weren't people going for a weekend in Guadalajara or something and uh, just had a touristy need to master some Spanish. Uh, these were people who had a real pressing need. It was dollars and cents. It was their livelihood. Yeah. And we had also French, German, Hebrew, um, uh, several languages. And it just ran and ran. Uh, I have a, I made up a montage showing all the publications in which it ran. Harper's Atlantic, New York Times Magazine. Uh, so it uh, definitely had a certain currency. I even... It, it even contributed a phrase to the language because I'd see newspaper cartoons and articles and uh, comic riffs on it. Uh, so when that happens, uh, when, a, when an advertising slogan becomes part of the language, you know it's really embedded itself right. into the culture, uh, especially if a comedian thinks, oh, if I make fun of this, everybody will know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that. And that's got to be a proud moment. You see your headline come up in common vernacular and common, you know, talk. Do you mind? Can I link up that um, that ad up in the, in the post? Oh, sure. Okay. I'll link it yeah, up. Yeah, so absolutely. If you it. have any trouble finding it, just yeah, uh, let me know. That'd be great. Um, so I also want to hear for you, obviously, you know, those are the things that worked. Um, what are some of the common mistakes people make in their advertising and, and how they can be avoided? Well, here is where I think I can help your audience because I'm sure uh, it's our audience, you, our audience, uh, our audience, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I assume they're all watching because they're in business. They have something to sell, yeah. some product or service. And uh, one thing that uh, has always surprised me, I'm sure everyone has had this experience. Uh, I'm in New York City, but no matter where you are, you've got a local newspaper. Now maybe it's online, but here we often have uh, community handouts in uh, street boxes and retailers will uh, run ads. And invariably, I shake my head in disbelief at these because they make the same mistakes. Uh, I often say, suppose you've got Joe who's a florist. Well, he buys an ad, pays money for it, and the headline is, 
Joe's Flower Shop. Well, that's not the headline. That's the logo. And the real headline is Roses Half Off This Week Only uh, because it's going to be the guy who's uh, almost forgot his wife's birthday and uh, or you need flowers for some other occasion. So basically, the problem is not understanding the customer, uh, his or her needs, targeting him, not focusing on the reader. The uh, Joe's Flower Shop headline is an example of what years and years ago used to be called manufacturer's copy. You don't hear that phrase much, but it referred to where they're boasting about, this is our factory, uh, this is our office, this is our inventory, mm -hmm. and the customer doesn't care about that. He only cares, how do I solve my problems, and mm -hmm. is giving this guy some money going to help me with, with my problem. Uh, so... Uh, Years ago, um, I formulated this with a little rule I call Houtman's Law. It goes, start with the prospect, not with the product. Start with the prospect, not with the product. And it's a way of rephrasing what they used to call features versus benefits. Yeah. Uh, one example I remember is that uh, if you have a portable dishwasher, uh, the feature is that it's 29 inches tall, but the benefit is slides easily under any kitchen counter. So that's one of the things we copywriters do all the time. We try to take the features mm. and translate them into benefits. Some other common mistakes are where you make claims without proof. They're just boasts. You need to have something to add to credibility. We'll talk about that. Uh, there are no specifics, just vague promises where it's specifics like hard numbers, facts, figures that convey the credibility. And finally, uh, there's the omission of a human interest element, storytelling, which as I'm sure you know, uh, can be enormously powerful when it's deployed correctly. Yeah, yeah. And then I want to talk about storytelling in a second, but I have to go back to the successful campaigns because the learn Spanish like a diplomat keeps what you just described and how it went out was so valuable. Can you talk about one of the other ones like tax angles and what medium did it go out in? How did people see that? Oh, like, sure. Yeah. Well, tax angles is certainly my favorite story, and I really have to give credit to Bob Kephart, who was my mentor uh, and my first client. Unfortunately, he died uh, after a long illness a few years ago, yeah, sure. but I owe, I owe everything my whole career to Bob. And shortly after I began working for him, he came to me with this um, proposal, this idea he had to start a newsletter on taxes. And I was so young and inexperienced, I, it took me a while to grasp what he was saying. But he had something he called the businessman's lament. And it went like this. I have two attorneys and an accountant, but they never come to me with tax cutting ideas. All I get from them is routine paperwork and a lot of sympathy. What do I have to do to cut my tax bill? And uh, Bob's response was, in effect, you, the taxpayer executive, are making a big mistake. You can't wait for these guys to come to you because they'll never come to you yeah. with ideas. It's not their job. They're conservative. They don't spend their days thinking, how can I help this particular client? So the argument, the proposition we laid forth was, you need to find these ideas you need on your own. You have to keep up with developments and then go to your professional and say, look at this. Can we use this? And that was what Tax Angles provided. It was a forum. Uh, it was edited by a fellow named Vern Jacobs, very experienced in taxes and tax cutting. And so every month the reader would receive a um, uh, short articles on new, interesting, overlooked ways to cut your taxes. And we hoped the reader would do what we told him to. We would, he would see, oh, maybe I can use this. I'd better ask George uh, if, if this is something we can do. I might point out, finally, the name Tax Angles, which was my suggestion. It had just a little bit of edginess to it. It suggested these aren't the ideas you would get from H&R Block. Uh, there might be a little bit of risk, but there'd also be a big advantage, and we will tell you the risks as well as, as the benefits. Mm -hmm. So that's the tax angle story. Uh, one thing I might mention, it was I, because of a little bit of PR, uh, Bob Stone, whom your readers might recall, a, a big name in direct marketing, he had a column in Advertising Age, the 
weekly tabloid uh, about direct marketing, and he did an entire story about the launch of Tax Angles, a full page of Ad Age, uh, mentioning Bob, mentioning me, uh, and um, uh, he agreed that it was, he called it like the classic direct marketing launch story. I love that. And Don, I don't know if you were going to plan on mentioning this later, but you have a great story about the subscription renewal for tax angles and the advice Bob gave you. Were you going to mention that later? Yeah, on, we, could, we could talk about that now. I think you like your interviewees to talk about their mentors and what they learned from them. And I'm happy to talk about yeah. it here. Uh, well, if, you're gonna, were, if you were going to talk about it later, just save it for the... <laughs> For, for talking about Bob and some of the good advice. I just didn't okay. want to miss that story because it's such yep. a good story. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure we, we hit on that. And before I go to the storytelling, anything else to mention about like organized executive that would be interesting? How did that go out and what was the meeting? Well, this, uh, yeah, this is another good story. I sometimes like to say it made me more money and royalties than anything I had written, which shows you uh, how successful it was because the royalties are based on the quantities that are mailed. Mm -hmm. And... Believe me, no one is going to mail and spend money unless it's working and, and continuing to work. But um, uh, uh, this was a tear sheet. Uh, I don't know if your, you and your viewers explain, have Yeah, explain seen. what a tear sheet is. Well, this was something that a few people I worked with created. It, in some cases, it got them into trouble because it people thought they were being fooled by it. But basically, it was an ad that looked like it had been torn out of a magazine, and very often there would be a post-it note, and there would be handwritten, um, Jeremy, really worth looking into, and signed by John or something. Mm -hmm. So we tried to create the idea that this came from somebody you know, mm -hmm. and Magalogs use this, and, you know, it's just, it's a way to get through that barrier, the junk mail barrier. And so we had a picture of probably, I think we just took a stock photo, and it showed a wealthy, good-looking executive in front of his, um, uh, an airplane, private uh, airplane, and uh, the headline was, um, how America's most successful executives um, uh, get so much accomplished in so little time. The um, newsletter was edited by Stephanie Winston, who was probably the queen and diva of professional organizers, and she had done massive research into how managers and executives uh, uh, conduct their professional lives and uh, how they avoid time wasters and so on and so on. So basically, I just read a lot of Stephanie's work um, and uh, pulled out that headline. We may have tested some other things, mm -hmm. but it just ran and ran uh, and was mailed in the hundreds of thousands, maybe the millions, uh, for this particular newsletter. Uh, other than that, I have no great secret. I, there was no eureka moment of how I came up with it. It just seemed like a natural way to convey the big benefit of the publication. Yeah. And Don, you were talking about, obviously, some of the common mistakes people make with features and benefits and focusing on the prospect. What were some things in that organized executive that you think made it so successful? Well, it's been a while since I've written it or even read it, but I know we told some stories, some real life stories of uh, executives who had certain problems, maybe it's um, underlings coming into their office all the time or mm. uh, delegation where they're micromanagers and can't uh, assign work to other people. So we told some real stories. That was also one of the secrets of the tear sheet uh, technique and uh, that gave it some real credibility. Uh, that proof element that I mentioned earlier, uh, when you're dealing with real human beings and their problems and solutions, that adds a real element of believability. And maybe this is a good segue into the whole human interest area we were going yeah. to discuss yeah. next. Yeah, so talk about the storytelling and human interest, because I know you have some really good examples uh, of this. Well, um, I do have one good example, but first let me say, uh, I th there's an old phrase, I forget wh where it comes from, but it's inherent drama. You find the inherent drama. And this requires some real work. It takes time and effort, and that's why it's probably not done 
that often or done right. You have to do research. You have to interview. You dig. When you find someone to talk to, you have to be part psychologist and part detective because people are not natural storytellers. Right. And you really have to use some effort to get the facts out of them. Uh, you want details, color, to add vividness and credibility. And if, if, you're, if it's a real story with a beginning, middle, end, you want plot, pacing, creating a sense of excitement, maybe even a twist or a surprise ending uh, in the style of O. Henry. Uh, here's one good example of this, and it's a longtime favorite. Um, for many years, I worked for Phillips Publishing, which is founded by Tom Phillips. Um, at one time, it was the largest newsletter publisher in America, and one of Tom's earliest uh, publications uh, was a newsletter called Cardiac Alert, which helped people with heart disease and heart conditions. And uh, Tom told me his story, and I translated into what's called a lift letter, uh, a small, you know, there's always a long, long letter in a direct mail package, but then sometimes there's a secondary letter. So on the outside of this letter, I had in handwriting uh, simulated pen script. When I was 16, my father died of a heart attack. And then when we got into the letter, it told Tom's story, his um, uh, father did pass away when he was a teenager. Uh, he, uh, he knew that uh, cardiac ailments tend to be inherited. He began, he said, I, in his, it was a first person story, he said, I began reading everything I could on the subject and I subscribed to Cardiac Alert, which at that time had another publisher. And uh, he talked about how it helped him. And then, in a twist, uh, he had an opportunity to acquire the publication and become its publisher. Mm -hmm. So, we concluded by saying, I hope, you know, you will now join me, you know, just as I became a subscriber, I hope uh, you'll subscribe too if you have these problems. And the, I, I don't know if anyone was able to separate out the results of the lift letter from everything else, but Tom was convinced it was powerful and he even included it in packages that other copywriters wrote uh, because he was convinced that it added to the power of the package. Yeah. One more negative example, just recently... Let me ask you about that yeah. example for a second. So, conducting your research with him, how did you uncover, was this obvious? Did you know after talking to him, that's what you were going to include? Or how did you conduct the research with Tom to decide to put, make, put that information in the lift letter? Well, at that time, you know, Tom eventually went on to, you know, he, he was enormously busy with uh, dozens of publications, but um, at, the, at the time he had only a handful of newsletters and we were close and we were able to talk about things face to face. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I forget whether this was done in person or by phone, but we must have sat down one day and I said, tell me the background of this publication. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you come to become its publisher? Uh, what are the personal details? Um, uh, and uh, you reminded me of Eugene Schwartz, who is what was one of the great masters of copywriting. And he used to talk about how he did. He said, "Sit down with the client and pump the hell out of him, and <laughs> just get everything you need to know, and you know, just let him talk and talk and have it recorded, and um, take notes and put them on index cards, and uh, and somewhere in there is is going to be um, the." Um, you know, the, the secret, the nugget you're looking for. One of uh, Gene's stories is when he met um, uh, that famous memory expert. What was his name? I remember it was Harry Lorraine. And <laughs> when he first met Harry, Harry said to him, give me five minutes and I'll give you a push button memory. And that became the, the headline. Now, you might say again, it was handed to Gene on a platter, but Harry probably said, Many other things. There probably such as, three hours of conversation. Yeah, he probably said, I'm, I, "I'm going to get some uh, canapes and <laughs> from the buffet and so so." But that he was smart enough to recognize that that was the headline. Yeah. So um, that was the uh, the cardiac alert story, yeah. and uh, I'll, I'll mention one other amusing detail. I was once at a conference of publishers, and there was a guy giving a plenary session, and he said, I have this great lift letter here, and I, I don't know who wrote it, but it's, so I'm standing in the back of the room, and of course, I couldn't say, 
I'm the one who wrote it. Uh, but afterward, I told him, and he did apologize, but I thought if only he had mentioned my name, I probably would have had a dozen people coming to me uh, to hire me. Do you have a set of questions that you would ask when you conduct the research, or do you just kind of start off with asking the background and just let them run with it? No, as a matter of fact, I, I created early in my career what I called an agenda, a new client agenda, and I had about 30 questions on it, and it's actually gone viral. It's on uh, AWAI's uh, site, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, school for copywriters, which is awaionline.com. Yeah. If you search my name there, it's not behind a paywall. So it's, it's, that's my copywriting research agenda. And I would always, one of the early questions was that one I've mentioned before, what are your customers or readers' uh, biggest problems, concerns, uh, what are they worried about? What keeps them up all night? And then on the other side, what opportunities do they say? What are the positives? What do they want to know? Um, so, uh, again, I would learn some of that from interviewing the client, but other aspects of it um, uh, uh, I, I would get from, from the reading of the... In a way, perhaps I was fortunate because so many of my clients were publications and being something of a reclusive hermit I could just say send me the last two or three or five years of issues and I would just read them all cover to cover and make notes and extract things uh, if you're selling uh, uh, industrial machinery or something there's only so much you can read and other things you've got to get the product demonstration and you've got to talk to the uh, engineers and the people who use the product so um, it may be a little more complex to get the information you need. I had one other story on the storytelling or yeah. human interest. Uh, just a week or two ago, I do some pro bono work for think tanks and educational groups, and somebody asked me what I thought of a fundraising email we had just received. It was in my box, just as it was in his, and it told the story of a young black guy from a poor ghetto and he said something to the effect of um, uh, there were people who were vic victimized and he was somehow able to extricate himself but that's where it stopped and I thought you know this is a lazy or ignorant writer because we never got any of the details uh, who was victimized how what did he experience personally uh, was he in uh, mugged and attacked and get into fights was he did he use drugs did he sell drugs all that was missing so there was that inherent drama that was just ignored uh, and that's why you know if the writer whoever he or she was had done a little bit more digging had gotten this guy into a room and pumped him for several hours uh, took notes had a tape recorder on um, there would have been so much more in that story that would have I think the the drama and the excitement of it would have motivated people to give money. Again, this was a uh, a fundraising appeal, which may be even more difficult because you're asking for people to part with their funds without a quid pro quo mm -hmm. uh, necessarily. So I've always thought I've done fundraising copy, and I've always thought it's it's more challenging because you're you're trying to extract the cash from people, but you're not saying, well, here's a book or a flowers or chocolates in exchange. So what are some of the fundraising, do you remember any of your fundraising uh, campaigns that you did? Well, I have to tell you, I started out back in the, um, um, in the uh, mid-70s, 1975, with Bob Kepbart, and he was a libertarian, as I am, and he put me in touch with a number of organizations that um, try to raise funds for political purposes, for social change, for free market kinds of things and I discovered that I did some of it but I didn't like it quite as much mm -hmm. uh, perhaps because of that challenge I, I was more comfortable offering the quid pro quo right. you give us your money and we give you something that's going to help you and I think it's tougher to sell an abstraction yeah. like changing the world but I did learn that many of the same rules apply and m people make many of the same mistakes the absence of specifics the human interest factor um, I see this all the time uh, and perhaps in my experience it's the nonprofits and the charities who are weakest at this although there are some that do it extremely well and uh, there are about um, 
20 organizations that I give money to, so I get all their stuff, uh, sometimes daily, and so I've seen the worst of it and I've seen the best yeah. of it. But um, I sometimes say that copywriting isn't rocket surgery, as the joke goes. Uh, it, it's something that uh, can be mastered, although I found that uh, very often it's, um, it's tough to teach these things. Not everybody is a natural copywriter or born marketer, which is why copywriters will, I think, always be in business. Yeah. So, Don, tell me about this, actually, because you mentioned, okay, you get letters and nonprofit, you know, campaigns sent to you. Which would you remember which ones, because the ones you donate to that you're like, wow, this is a really good letter or what hooked you in to one of the, the letters that you've gotten? Oh, gosh, uh, I would have to think about this. Uh, uh, I guess so. one that comes to mind is that classic. I don't know if they're still using it. It was for one of those Save the Children uh, uh, organizations, and it would show the poor, helpless, but rather cute little girl in the third world country, and the headline would be, you can help little Maria, or you can turn the page. And I always thought it was a magnificent uh, illustration of creating unearned guilt. Uh, and uh, again, it must have worked because it ran for years and years. And uh, so that was a, a good example. I learned something for, I don't know how many people remember, Ernest Dichter. He was the founder of motivational research. Okay. Uh, he was the guy who said when people buy soup, it brings back memories of being in the womb, floating in all that amniotic fluid. <laughs> so uh, frankly, I can't vouch for that. But he did say that people feel good when they give money to a cause and therefore maybe instead of showing the recipients as in the Maria ad we should be showing groups of happy donors after they've they've given the money uh, but I've never seen any group take his advice on that point but he, he had some he had some good advice on both consumer research and for nonprofit fundraisers yeah I like that so and you've talked a lot about market research in general what do people do wrong yeah, they do a lot of things wrong. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, I decided I would stop answering surveys because it was so frustrating to look at them and to see how many of the wrong questions they asked, that the approach was wrong. They all tend to make the same mistakes they ask about themselves when they should be asking about the reader. And I saw this happen in my clients who publish newsletters and magazines. They would ask questions like, um, uh, what sort of articles should we be running? Rate the content of the past issue from 1 to 10. And really what this is trying to do is turning the reader into an editor. But the reader isn't an editor. He's not qualified to be an editor. So the questions they really should be asking are, again, you know, what sort of problems do you have in your work if it's a business publication? Uh, what are you concerned about right now? What are the trends that, you're, that's, that are going to affect your business in the next 12 months? And then once you know the answers to those questions from the prospects or customers or readers' perspective, then you can shape both the editorial content of the publication and the promotional copy. But people just don't seem to realize that. And I constantly see these bizarre questions. And I sometimes I wonder that one, one of the, the rules is, what are we going to do with this answer once we get it? Right. And I think if people ask themselves that question, half or more of the survey questions that are used in market research wouldn't even be asked. But if you do it right... It can pay off. It, it's, there's really a gold mine out there. Here are some examples of how I used market research in my work. Uh, years ago, I did a direct mail uh, campaign for a Canadian publication called the Bank Credit Analyst. This is read by all the super hedge fund uh, masters of the universe. And I did a survey, and one of the things, one of the subscribers came back and said, it keeps me out of trouble. And that was such so succinct, so perfect, we use that in the advertising. Uh, another newsletter was called Commercial Lease Law Insider. It went to the owners of shopping centers and office buildings and told them about how to do their, their leases. And one of the things we discovered from the survey is that they really loved it when we gave them explicit 
language that they could use verbatim in their leases. Mm -hmm. Now, didn't they have lawyers? Maybe. Maybe some act as their own law. Maybe they just preferred to see what we would tell them. So um, this was one of the features of the newsletter. I didn't invent it, but we learned how important it was, and we emphasized it in the promotion. When we were trying to get people to part with their money, many of these newsletters, by the way, are hundreds of dollars a year. They're not cheap. And uh, when we were trying to convince them to subscribe, we, we were able to emphasize that point. Yeah. I launched a newsletter called Bank Mergers and Acquisitions, and we discovered through research that the big problem when two institutions merge is that there were culture clashes, that there was a different culture in one than the other, and we were able to give little cases and examples of how these problems were solved. We used real names, Wells Fargo and so forth. And then finally, um, I uh, wrote copy for a newsletter called The Successful Hotel Marketer, which was aimed at hospitality people and how to book more rooms and get more guests. And there we told success stories. I did a lot of interviews and we found uh, ease, relatively easy, inexpensive ways that um, uh, hotel people could get more guests. One of them, I remember, was they invited a bunch of hockey stars to stay free, and the hockey uh, players attracted guests. Uh, so um, these are some of the ways that, in my experience, doing market research correctly pays off. You just get so much information, but again, like most things in life, it takes time, it takes effort. Not everyone is willing to expend that. So you either need to hire somebody who's going to do it correctly for you or you learn how to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's to me, it's like um, money on a table and no one is picking it up. They just don't know if they would just do the research and do it right. There's so much you can learn that can then be redeployed to make you money. So I have a note here to ask about testimonials. Yeah, What's that was the last... Well, here, testimonials come out of market research. That's how you find them. Now, there are cases where they just drop into your lap because a customer sends you a fan letter or an email or something, but you can't count on that. That is like lanyap. It's like manna from heaven, and it's great when it happens. But really, you have to get out there and encourage mm -hmm. the testimonials. And to me, the most important thing is you just don't want somebody to say, if it's a publication, I read every issue or almost any product, I love it, I wouldn't be without it. Those are empty. They're just superlatives. What you really want are case studies where someone says, your product helped me in a particular way, helped me avoid a problem, made me money, um, or whatever. And one example that comes to mind is for a stock market newsletter and um, when I did this, we sent it out to some percentage of the customers, subscribers. We didn't know who would respond, but one guy said he was a bartender. And uh, I guess this is a kind of freelance profession, but he said he didn't have a pension plan, an IRA, and so he depended on this newsletter to help him build your build his portfolio. Hmm. And I think we had a little bit about you know how much it had appreciated and in effect he was thankful uh, to the publisher for giving him the assuring him his retirement security when the tips you know that the drunken customers would leave would not do that for him so that's yet another benefit of market research it can give you really solid powerful endorsements that can convince more customers to buy your products yeah. so Don how did you and the company actually conduct some of the surveys? Well, uh, technology changed this. Early yeah. on, we would do it mostly by mail. We yeah. would send out uh, a um, maybe four questions and a covering letter. Uh, maybe there would be an offer of an incentive, a free report or an extension of your subscription yeah. if you completed it, and then there would be the postage paid return envelope. So it would take you know, a week for it to go out and another week or two to come back. Uh, then when fax came along, we did the same thing by fax. Uh, sometimes I did it by phone, but of course that's the most 
time-consuming way, but it can also be the most rewarding way mm -hmm. because when the bartender says something, you can say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about such and such. So in a phone conversation, you have that interactivity. Mm -hmm. And then finally, uh, Survey Monkey came along. That's the the big one. There are others. And before I retired, uh, we did some of these with Survey Monkey. And the beauty of that is that, I mean, you can still be sending out the surveys when literally minutes later you're getting back the first replies. Mm -hmm. And um, I read recently there's now uh, a certain amount of resistance to surveys. People, mm -hmm. you know, they're overwhelmed with. Um, advertising, they're afraid of the CIA, of, you know, of uh, surveillance kind of intrusions, and even the pollsters like Roper and Gallup, I think, are having difficulty now. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's more of a challenge, but, you know, we marketers thrive on challenges, and there, some people are probably thinking as we speak of ways to overcome that, that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that brings me to my next question, which you, you sort of alluded to, which is, so how did you get people to actually fill out the surveys? Because you could spend all this money and time sending it to them, whether it's via mail or on the phone or you know, via their email. How do you actually get them to fill it out? Well, certainly not everybody would do it. Yeah. I forget what uh, percentages, but I there were times when I went through literally hundreds of responses. Uh, people like to talk. They like to communicate. And um, uh, maybe uh, I would hope that because my... Um, my way of doing it was more you focused, reader focused. Uh, maybe that boosted the response somewhat. But we got amazing. I mean, people would we'd leave spaces for them to fill it out, and they'd be in the margins and on the back and attaching their own. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, oh yeah. Pe people, some people will um, will respond, especially with. Uh, subscription newsletters, which often have a kind of, there's almost a personal bond. You have a, um, the writer, editor, uh, tells you what stocks to buy and what financial decisions to make, and these people are worshipped almost like rock stars or gods. Uh, so a real uh, sense of connection or bonding develops uh, between the newsletter guru and his subscribers, and that also, in my, in the case of the clientele that I had, that probably boosted the response. Yeah. I mean, is there a certain wording you use in that when you send out the the surveys that gets them thinking that they want to respond to this guru? Or well, you, I you think I incentives yeah. also that you. Yeah, well, I, I think we simply said, uh, you know, we could use your help. Uh, we may have. Uh, put a little flattery as a long-time subscriber, you're in a position to help us. And we didn't, you know, with the, the incentive, you always run into the problem of whether this, uh, a bribe will bias the results. Right. Uh, but these were things like, you know, we'll, we'll uh, extend your subscription a few months, uh, we'll give you a special report, uh, the sort of thing you give people in renewals. Um, there was nothing, um, I've received things in the mail where there's a dollar bill and uh, to me, that's a bit over the top. I sometimes wonder how many of those were just mulched. You know, they were tossed in the garbage and uh, with the, the bills uh, still in them. Uh, but that's a, that was a common uh, sort of incentive. And sometimes they would say, you know, we, uh, we're not pretending that the dollar compensates you for your time. We suggest you give it to a favorite child or a charity or something like that. But uh, I had my own particular way of doing it. And I was, again, I wasn't trying, it was different from the ones that uh, many magazines and TV stations do. They're their demographic surveys. They want to know how many people buy cameras, how often, so that they can go to the camera manufacturers and say, this is why you should advertise in our publication. But that wasn't of interest to me. The newsletters I worked for almost invariably they didn't take advertising mm. so that sort of demographic research wasn't what I was after and I wasn't doing public opinion polling you know to for candidates or things like that but I had my own uh, particular goals to find out what they liked and disliked about the publication uh, stories anecdotes testimonials endorsements that was the sort of thing even the wording like the keeps me out of trouble uh, to see how they express things right. in their own words. And by the way, that's why I was a big 
fan of the open-ended questions, not the checkoff. I tried never to use the you know, multiple choice uh, kind of thing, because I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in their own words, which, in my view, was more candid, more believable, more honest, more accurate than simply checking off true, false, or a multiple choice listing. Yeah, that makes sense. And that gives them, you know, your, their words so you can kind of use it. And Don, so I want to talk about your background a little bit. What was it like growing up? How'd you break into advertising? Well, I had a fairly uneventful childhood. I grew up in a suburb of New York. Uh, my parents were both school teachers, and uh, I developed somehow an interest in the advertising interest, uh, industry from an early age. It was the Mad Men era, and that was what fascinated me. All those big advertising agencies, Young and Rubicam and Doyle Dane Burnback, mm -hmm. it seemed terribly glamorous. I didn't know uh, direct response or direct marketing. Uh, and my father, knowing of my interest, he bought me a copy. I must have been in high school or junior high school, and he bought me David Ogilvie's book, Confessions of an Advertising Man. Mm -hmm. Again, your viewers, our viewers, uh, probably know that David Ogilvie was one of the legends of advertising. And I read the book and found it um, uh, interesting. He, Ogilvie, in fact, was an admirer of direct marketing. He called it my first love and my secret weapon. But he did the usual um, Madison Avenue uh, kinds of things, imperial margarine and uh, uh, Rolls Royce and so forth. Anyway, um, I went to college and then the Navy. And then when I got out in 1974, I began looking for a job in advertising and was turned down by dozens or hundreds of, of employers. Uh, and then I picked up a newspaper and there's this full page ad from Ogilvy's agency, Ogilvy and Mather. And they're looking for, they're going to have, they're announcing a contest, a competition to find one junior copywriter at $10,000 a year. So I entered the competition, and I was one of 10 finalists and got an interview at the headquarters of the agency with a woman named Riva Corda, who headed his U.S. division. But unfortunately, they gave the, the one job to someone else, and nothing was ever done for us nine runners-up. So fast forward a few years, and... Uh, Another book by Ogilvy comes out called Ogilvy on Advertising. And in the introduction, he gives his address. He lived in a castle in France, a chateau. And so I couldn't resist writing him. <laughs> and I included some of my work and indicated that I had achieved some measure of success. And I told him about the competition and how I was one of the uh, losers or runners up. So I get back in the mail a postcard handwritten by David and he wished me well and concluded with the words, sorry to have missed you when you were so cheap. <laughs> so that's one of my favorite stories and I've regaled audiences of 300 copywriters with that, that particular tale. So it does have an interesting uh, kind of um, irony or closure to yeah. it. But really looking back, I'm glad that I did not um, get a job with these agencies. Uh, I learned that direct marketing is far more rational. We're more accountable. We know what works, uh, unlike the hypothetical Coca-Cola billboard I cited earlier. And uh, I maybe I would have just been an anonymous drone in some Madison Avenue shop all these years instead of carving out a career and achieving some uh, uh, fame and um, uh, accomplishments in the world of direct marketing. So, Don, when you did win an ad contest when you were 13. Oh, yeah. Tell, yeah, that's, tell, uh, tell people that story. That's a good one. Well, um, I, 13, 14, I forget exactly. Yeah. I was certainly young, and uh, I, the uh, suburb I grew up in is Staten Island, which I don't know if people know much about it uh, elsewhere, but it's certainly not Manhattan, uh, middle-class kind of um, bedroom community. And the local, in the local newspaper, there was an auto dealership that invited people to write an ad. So um, I didn't know much about cars. I think it was used cars, but I did a cartoon of a uh, 
buyer examining an engine with a jeweler's loop and the headline was nothing escapes us in other words we look at we go through every used car to make sure it's in perfect shape before we sell it so i did uh, win that contest and there was a hundred dollar check and uh, picture of myself in the newspaper shaking hands with the guy who ran the um, the dealership and it actually leads to a an interesting irony as I grew up I never bothered learning how to drive uh, people are still amazed uh, at that and uh, at one point I was asked to um, I, I had a client who published an automotive magazine and uh, everyone poked fun at me uh, here I am writing uh, to car lovers without being a driver of cars. But of course, there's nothing particularly amusing or ironic about that. Every copywriter writes about things, about subject matter, and to people, and he, you know, his audience is somebody he's not a member of. I mean, I've written to bankers and chemical engineers, and my favorite example, whim, uh, owners of women's clothing stores. Uh, that was somewhat distant from my usual everyday life. So it's, you know, the copywriter, one of his or her main jobs and challenges is to put himself into the shoes or more accurately the mind of the prospect. And some of the best and most successful campaigns and ads and headlines were those that somehow got into the mind of the prospect yeah. uh, and it's perhaps one of the toughest things to do but when you've cracked that code um, that's the secret and again that's one of the reasons the market research and the interviewing are so important to unlock uh, what's going on in in the mind of the prospect and also something which he or she might not be willing you know to talk about openly uh, if it's some embarrassing thing like I'm a procrastinator or what have you. Uh, so you've got to approach it in an oblique kind of manner, or you've got to intuit certain things that the person is not going to tell you outright. Yeah, Diane, we were talking about some of the your stories. That Nothing Escapes Us headline just stuck out. Even from an early age, you were writing these these great headlines, and have you seen that used or? Well, I probably would do it differently today. What you also would. amazed me is I, 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 I did this rough sketch. I do have some artistic talent, though I'm not uh, a professional artist. And they just ran the, you know, ran it as I did it. And I said to the guy who owned the dealership, I thought you would hire a, uh, an artist to do. Oh, no, we wouldn't change what you did. Um, uh, certainly, I think I, I mean, I was just intuiting. Uh, even at that age, it yeah. does say something, I guess, that I was uh, destined to be a copywriter. Uh, and uh, I just had a hunch that if somebody buys a used car, the first thing they're going to be concerned about is what sort of condition is this in and what did the previous owner do yeah. to it? Uh, you know, what do they say now? They don't even say used cars. They're now repurposed or there's some euphemism that the industry uses. Uh, and still today, I do see, uh, you know, it's certified. Right. It's, right. Yeah, they, uh, there's all sorts of assurances to the buyer that this isn't a lemon. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was just something, even at that tender age, I was able to, to intuit or guess right. from what little I knew. So that's my story, and now the whole world knows that I don't drive a car. So <laughs> one of my shocking secrets. Yeah, so Don... So you don't drive. What are some other personal details that may surprise people? Well, the, these are probably less embarrassing. I, I've had a passion since childhood for a musical theater. I uh, live right near Broadway, so I can, in a matter of minutes, I can see a show. And uh, for half a century, I've been in the audience of all kinds of, you know, Phantom of the Opera and Cats and Wicked and all of these shows your audience has heard of, if they're not passionate as I am about it. But two years ago, I was able to bring back, I was able to help revive a favorite musical via Kickstarter. Everybody knows really? about crowd crowdfunding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a show called Man with a Load of Mischief. If I start talking about it, it'll take several hours. So uh, I'll just mention that the, the page is still up on Kickstarter with the video we created. But we were able to raise about twenty five, thirty thousand $30,000, wow. uh, which was enough to bring back a small-scale concert revival of the show here in New York, um, you know, with the unions just uh, 
if you move a piece of scenery an inch, you're paying $3,000 just for that. Uh, but it was really exciting to be behind the scenes of uh, show business and a producer, in effect, uh, after being uh, simply a spectator for mm -hmm. all those decades. And I should say that my copywriting skills uh, helped me uh, because I was able to pitch the request for contributions mm -hmm. uh, using all the techniques and secrets of copywriting, the rewards we offered. I just read something recently uh, that may be obvious, but it said that some people had done some research on Kickstarter and they found that the precise words that are used, I mean, just the change of one word to another word can have an enormous effect on the people, you know, convincing people to mm -hmm. donate money or how much they donate. Well, again, it wouldn't come as a surprise to you right. and me, but it seemed to <laughs> for the people who, who conducted this, um, this survey. So um, It was a big revelation. Copy affects yeah. how much people give. The, I, sh I should go back to that email and, and save that. Um, uh, one more interesting personal Wait, fact. This, yep. Don. So what did you do for the, the Kickstarter campaign? Or what did well, you include that that you thought would well, work well? Basically, I worked with the uh, composer, John Clifton. We yeah. became friends. We're almost neighbors. And um, uh, this was a, a show I discovered when I was a teenager in college. Mm -hmm. I've loved it. And I found even people in New York who think they know musical theater backwards and forwards have never heard of Man with a Load of Mischief. But it's just a charming, delightful, wonderful show with a great music and great story. And I thought more people should know about it. I'd like to see it revived personally. And we simply, we they do say that the video in crowdfunding is important. Right. And John had some, he has a home studio. He has more talent in audio and video production than most people do. So we did a, a terrific uh, two or three minute um, uh, video. I have a brief cameo with a testimonial and we just played some of the music and told some of the background on it. And um, many of my friends personally, I think that often happens with crowdfunding. It's your personal list, your friends, your relatives who are going to contribute. But we also had strangers uh, contributing, people we never heard of. And many people came back and said, oh, I, f I love this show too. And people think I'm crazy because I talk about it so much. And uh, quite a few people um, uh, uh, came out of the woodwork and turned out to be fans of the show when we had our opening night party. And of course, for a certain level, you know, you got to the performance and the party. One guy told us he flew from Oregon just to see uh, our uh, modest concert production. Wow. So um, uh, that's a little bit about the, the show. Yeah. We're still hoping for a major uh, revival with sets and costumes, but again, that costs even more money, and we might have to do another. I mean, obviously, you had your hand in the copy aspect. What worked with some of the, the copy, whether it was in the video or in the rewards that you came up with? Well, I'd have to go back and think. I know one, one thing I think people told us is that I think you have to contribute $100 to get two tickets for a performance in the party, which is a pretty good deal here in New York when you can pay $400 for a, a seat for some shows on Broadway. And uh, we had many people, several people telling us I was going to contribute $10 or $25, but when I saw I could get to the show in the party, I upped it to the $100 or more level. Mm -hmm. And we had people contributing thousands of dollars. And we, mm. you know, we never quite knew knew why, uh, what motivated them. But, uh, you know, with Kickstarter, mainly it's for gadgets. They're the, you know, the, uh, the iPad cases and things right, like that. Right. We were doing something a little bit different and less tangible. But... Um, you have another interesting story, Dan, about related to musicals, where someone wrote you a letter. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, of course I do. Yes. I, um, so I, tell, I, tell us that. Uh, well, it's a fun story. I don't know if it has much of a moral. Um, I, this was in uh, 1980. I was in London for a client's conference, and I saw a show, a review. It may not matter what it is, but um, I thought uh, maybe if this comes to New York, I would invest in it. So I left a little note for the producer, and... Uh, 
when he was in New York, he called me and we chatted for a while and then I must have wound up on his mailing list because I got this invitation to invest in another show. And at the time I was married and my then wife came back from her job and I said to her, this is the stupidest idea for a musical I've ever heard. It was Cats, <laughs> which I later learned had broke a record and earned about $2 billion worldwide. <laughs> Uh, certainly one of the most successful musicals in, in history. So that shows you my judgment as an investor or as a producer. So I thought, you know, Dancing Cats on a Stage just uh, uh, did, not, did not sound like it was a moneymaker to me. Um, so uh, uh, that's one, one tale, uh, no pun intended, that, um, right. th that uh, demonstrates my lack of acumen in certain areas. And speaking of puns, I might just add on the personal level, um, as some, uh, most people who know me know, I have a special interest in language and wordplay. I've written two books uh, that were published by Dell. Uh, I still write articles on the subject. I love uh, playing with language. Some people call it recreational linguistics. And I have a little theory, which I think there's some research behind, uh, there's so much illiteracy in this country. It is, it is, uh, it's shocking. And many people, you know, if you inhabit literate circles, you don't even realize it. But people graduate from high school and even college, and they can't write a sentence. And you hear this. I have a whole file full of news articles about employers who say they hire college graduates and the job requires writing, it requires communication, it requires speaking, and they literally cannot put together a coherent paragraph. So my view is that if we can get people, especially kids, interested in playing with language and seeing the fun aspect of it at an early age, uh, then maybe that can make some small dent in the literacy crisis. When I think back to my being in first grade, third grade, I remember the grammar and the rote learning, but I can't remember ever a teacher saying, uh, look at this, how we can play with language, how there's a fun mm. element to it. And so that's my particular social cause, mm -hmm. and I've spoken on it and donated to literacy organizations, mm. uh, but I think more more can be done in this area. So, Don, what are your favorite puns that you personally have come up with? Because you have a couple books on the subject, too. Yeah, I do. I was afraid you would ask me this, and so I'll tell you one <laughs> that's not mine, but it is something of a classic among yeah. punsters. Uh, a length of rope walks into a bar, and the bartender says, we don't serve your kind here, and throws him out. So the rope stops a passerby and asks him to tie him up and unravel his edges. Then he goes back into the bar and the bartender says, say, aren't you the same rope I just threw out? And he says, no, I'm afraid not. Got it. You get it. I got it, yes. I was, so I was worried yeah. I wasn't going to get it and look dumb, <laughs> but... <laughs> well, that was, there used to be a uh, a publication and it would, every year it would announce the 10 best stressed puns of the year and that was one of them and I should point out that it may not have happened in reality exactly as I told but there is an example of a homonym and the way words can have a, a double sense and it's ridiculous and absurd but it makes you laugh and there is where I think kids if we look you know growing up and remember kids liked elephant jokes and how many elephants can you put into your lunchbox and so and that sense of absurdity appeals to kids at an early age later right. on there's a more cerebral uh, aspect to it right. and even adults you have um, I have a friend who teaches uh, literacy to adults and people from other countries or from the slums who never you know, never were taught properly. Right. It's also an indictment of our educational system, uh, but that's a whole other story we won't get into. Right. So, Don, and we, we've, throughout this interview, have talked about some of your favorite personal headlines that you've come up with. I wanted to hear about some of your favorite headlines that aren't yours. Yeah, I, from an early, I was a pack rat, and I had a swipe file, like most copywriters, where you right tear things out and you stick it in it and maybe it will inspire uh, something later on. And I can remember two things that caught my attention, and this goes back decades. Uh, one of them was an ad in a magazine and the headline was, how to buy the best portable TV from Sears or anyone else. 
and it was the last three words that really hold the secret. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an early example of what we're now calling content marketing or native advertising. You see those phrases everywhere. And there was the secret. They, you knew when you read it, you were going to get some useful information. Mm -hmm. And they weren't just trying to rope me into buying the ad from Sears, from their store, but he, this is something I can use even if I go to whatever, Best Buy or, you know, whoever was around at the time. So that to me was a classic ad. Another one was uh, that no one seems to remember, I even Googled it, uh, the New York Times. Well, you know, I'm not sure how the Times is viewed in other parts of the country. Here it's considered like the god of newspapers, but uh, ignoring the political aspects, the Times is liberal, and then we've got tabloids, the news and the post, which are more conservative and right-wing. But one of the things that people would say is the Times was huge, and these tabloids looked a lot faster and easier to read, and that was a barrier for them. So I remember this campaign, which ran in transit advertising. It said, you don't have to read it all, but it's nice to know it's all there. And to me, that showed such incisiveness. I mean, it drilled right, and I could see people saying, "Yeah, they're right. I, you know, I, I, I don't have to read every word of it, but they're the authoritative source." I should say that in the case of the Sears ad and the New York Times, I have no proof that either of these worked. These were not direct marketing; they were general advertising. Where, you know, as we know, I think Madison Avenue, they, they think they know what works, but they really don't because it doesn't have that instant trackability that direct marketing has where, you, where you're coded, you know if the order was generated by Don's package or by Bill's package, uh, but I still kept them and filed them and looked at them every few years as a source of inspiration because I thought they were both, both really on target. So Don, also, what was your, t your personal, what was the tax angles headline again? That worked so well. Uh, if you're counting on your tax advisor to cut your taxes, you're making the most expensive mistake of your life. Yeah. And I should say, I, when I first wrote it, it was biggest mistake. Right. And then I realized there was something weak about it, anemic. I often use the word anemic. And suddenly most expensive came to mind. And that just seemed to ring. Right, right. So I want to, yeah, I, I have a note on that because I remember you talking about, um, we had a previous conversation that you switched the word around. And how, how long does it typically, do you write like just a number of headlines or do you just write one and try and, to change the words? What's your, what was your format for coming up with uh, once you had a headline for modifying it? Well, I'm. Uh, this may be. I had a note to talk about the use of computers versus plain old uh, paper and pencil, and this may be a good time to to mention that uh, I would put something. I would have a yellow pad, blank, unlined yellow pad, and I would just write. Uh, I would free associate, and then when I was done free associated, I would I would use a thesaurus, a Roger's thesaurus, and there are other books of words to inspire copywriters uh, and reading as I read material associated with the project certain words would pop out I put them on the list and that's how I came up with the name tax angles by the way I had words like loopholes and dodges and tactics and suddenly I had angles and I said wow that fits so perfectly Bob agreed immediately um, the previous he had acquired the newsletter from the editor and it was called tax tricks and techniques and almost everyone agreed that tax angles was a better <laughs> shorter more concise um, so I find that this technique works for me uh, there's something called mind mapping that your viewers may know about the the I don't I haven't read all the books that goes coined by a guy named Tony Buzan, B-U-Z-A-N. And when I went to Amazon, I found he had written 10, 12, 15 books on mind mapping. And it's a kind of cerebral form of doodling. And you put down the words, and after you've exhausted the dictionaries and the sauruses, uh, then you just try to see which words generate other words, and you'll find they come into little constellations. There's a group having to do with this particular topic, and then there's another one on that. And I find that this works for me because it gets it down um, 
in one place where you can look at it. I, I try never to go to a second page. I want everything to be in one view so I can see the links and the connections. Somebody once said that all creativity is connectivity. You're just assembling uh, elements. And the point I wanted to make, uh, there's a story I was speaking at a gathering of copywriters and marketers, and there was this young guy in his 20s, and he knew, I hadn't even spoken yet, but he knew that I was the guest speaker, and he came up to me with his laptop, and he said, would you look at this draft of a promotion that I did? And when I looked at it, I was amazed, because, I mean, he said it was an early draft, and yet when I looked at the screen, he had everything all centered, the fonts were chosen, I mean, it looked like it was ready to be printed or posted online, and I happened to be carrying one of my trusty yellow pads, and I tried to convince him which may be an impossible task with kids today because they're so glued to their cell phones and their iPads and so forth. But I tried to convince him that there's something to be said for the old-fashioned paper and pencil. And you couldn't do, in, I don't think, that kind of brainstorming on a computer screen. Maybe somebody could convince me that you could use a stylus and so on. But to me, um, uh, even after computers came along and laptops and everything else, I was still doing the ideation stage, coming up with the ideas, you know, with the old-fashioned pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I once gave a talk on this, and I even mentioned you can go to companies like Levenger, levenger.com, which has all sorts of tools for writers, pads and pens and so forth. And um, uh, as I say, uh, I don't want to sound like Annie Ro Andy Rooney complaining about the younger generation, but uh, as in that particular case, I think this young copywriter was missing a bet because once you see something on the computer screen, it tends to be frozen in stone. I mean, even if you don't intend it, I think subconsciously, you're going to be blocking out all the other possibilities because this is what you've got on your screen and it looks so looks like complete, a final so version. finished. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so when early on, when things are malleable, um, uh, I, I think the brain is open yeah. to yeah. inspiration. So that's my my lesson yeah. from an earlier age before we had computers. I mean, these people have grown up. They never knew a time when there weren't computers and cell phones. So sometimes it pays to to get back to earlier ways of doing things. Yeah. And Don, you mentioned with the headline, you'd go, you'd go to Bob and you'd say, what do you think of this? How did you test your headlines or other components before obviously you're mailing it and you know some of these companies are spending lots of money to mail these pieces is there a way you tested things before actually sending it out the short answer is no um it was really my judgment it was the client's judgment i know of copywriters who swap work with each other they will show their work to another writer. I sometimes did that. Some of them will pay for it. And I've gotten some good advice from other writers. And I've given other writers good advice. Um, uh, so sometimes another set of eyes will be useful and will tell you something you've overlooked. But you're never really certain if something is going to work until uh, you mail it or yeah. you place it out there. This is why the the kind of market research they sometimes do on Madison Avenue where they show ads to people. Which one do you like? Would you buy this? And of course you're going to get bad answers because all sorts of uh, factors, they, people are going to say what they think makes them look good. Focus groups. I've learned some things from focus groups but in many cases what happens is that a leader emerges. There's some loudmouth who dominates the group and then everyone follows him right. so they don't look embarrassed. So you, by yeah. yeah, interviewing and focus groups, people try to do all these things, but the only thing that really matters is writing the check or charging the credit card. Right. When people are willing to pay for something, uh, that's the only test that matters. Yeah. And I wish there were some magical way yeah. to learn what's going to work beforehand. That would have saved my clients a lot of money and agony. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to talk, you obviously mentioned Bob a lot about mentors and some of the best advice. Who are your mentors and what are some of the best advice they've given you? Well, certainly Bob Kephart was yeah. my first client, my teacher, my mentor. Uh, I certainly made some mistakes with him and he was very indulgent and he would correct uh, things that I 
would have done wrong. But I did learn two interesting early lessons from him. After we launched Tax Angles, some weeks or months went by and he assigned me to write a renewal series. Well, everybody knows if you subscribe to anything, you're going to get a reminder to renew and another and another and another, sometimes 10 or 12. And people find them annoying, but they're mailed because they work. Right. You get money from the 12th letter. Uh, that's a whole story in itself. But I had never written a renewal series before, and Bob was really taking a chance on me. And I said, uh, I must have asked him something to the effect of, how, how do we do this? What do we say? And he said to me, we don't know much about these people, but we do know one thing. They all subscribed on the basis of your acquisition letter, the original package that I described earlier. By the way, the circulation at one point reached 71,000, which is pretty big for a newsletter. And I don't know if it was then or much later, I realized the wisdom of what he said. We don't know much about these people, but one thing we know for certain is that they all subscribed because of something you said in that initial letter. So that taught me a trick, which I later learned other people practiced. I simply cannibalized my own original letter. I took bits and pieces of it and sprinkled them through the 10 or 12 letters because if the guy um, subscribed because of uh, capital gains deduction something or other, then we put the capital gains deduction something or other in the second or third uh, letter to remind him, you know, that's why he subscribed and maybe next year he's going to need advice on that subject again. The other lesson I learned, which is um, uh, kind of embarrassing or amusing, before I started working for Bob, he had written an ad for a commemorative gold coin, and he wrote it himself, and the headline was, the most unique coin ever minted. Well, even then, I was a language maven, or thought I was, and concerned about grammar, so I pointed out that most unique is a mistake. It's a, an absolute. Uh, something can't be most unique any more than you can be a little pregnant, so you can't qualify it. So his response was, I know but it's making me so much money, I'm not going to change it. <laughs> so there was another lesson. It wasn't a grammar lesson, but it shows that you're not, as with the tax angles case, you're never going to know exactly what it is that made the work, the copy, the ad, the direct mail piece, what made it work. And so you change anything at your peril. I mean, even a simple word, as we were discussing with the Kickstarter uh, point, um, if you're going to change it, then you have to test it. You have to do an A-B split. I'm seeing that now people on the internet are using uh, A-B split testing. There was an article in Wired magazine about this, and the guy writes it as if, oh, oh we just invented this, <laughs> not even realizing that we were A-B split testing way back, you know, in the 1920s when John Caples, the great copywriter, was taking small newspaper ads and one has one headline, one has the other headline, and then you can learn you know, if it's done right, exactly which one is the, uh, it, 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 which one works, which is the most successful. So if you're going to, if, you know, it's okay to change things, but you, you would change it and test it if you possibly can. Mm -hmm. So, because otherwise you're never going to know for sure. Yeah. So Don, what are some of your proudest accomplishments? Well, the one I always cite as something I'm most proud of in terms of virtue or changing the world was a, um, it was a company called Knowledge Products, and they put out a set of recorded cassettes at that time called Audio Classics. And these were great works translated into audio, things like John Locke and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Adam Smith, Karl Marx. Uh, I have a great love for the humanities, and there were things I wish I had read or read more carefully in college. And there were a lot of adults, retired or still working, and they, too, have that poignant sense of remorse or regret that they didn't read all these things when they were in school. So these were dramatized, not just read. There was music and dialogue and so forth. And um, uh, I'm trying to remember my headline, but it was, uh, you know, the, um, the greatest works of all time. Now you can absorb them as easily as listening. And... Uh, we did direct mail, we did some space, we did some inserts, and it all worked uh, quite well. Uh, and today we've got this company called um, The Great Courses, 
Uh, it used to be called the Teaching Company. And uh, I have this theory that they wouldn't be around uh, if we hadn't shown them way back then how it could be done. It even turns out that their market, demographically, politically, socially, is identical to the one that Audio Classics had. So here, again, I said I'm interested in literacy, uh, language literacy, cultural literacy, and the fact that I could have helped bring these works to people who might never have, say, picked up a book. Uh, that is a proud accomplishment. But also, I thinking back not long ago, I realized that all the work I did had value, whether it was a newsletter on your health, a newsletter on investing, uh, these things, managing a business, how to be a leader, uh, how to run your small business more profitably. These were all things that people paid for because it could help them in some way, in some bottom line way, uh, money, health, uh, doing your job better. And so I think all the work I did had real value. People would pay sometimes $39 a year for a newsletter, but they got tremendous value out of it. And sometimes, you know, they might have been cu uh, cured or prevented from some disease or something. So, um, I think I and my clients really did some good things. I never, you know, I didn't um, advertise recreational drugs or, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, illegal gambling or things like that. I right. tried to stay on the side of virtue rather than vice. So, Don, there was another uh, fact is you won a lifetime copywriting achievement. Tell me about that experience. Well, I, I'm not sure how fascinating this is. I was at um, uh, uh, Bill Bonner, who heads Agora. He's a very successful publishing company. He lives in France, where he has a chateau, and uh, just like David Ogilvy did. And he often invites his staff members uh, there. And so I went there a couple of years ago and spoke, and they gave me this award, which I hadn't expected. Uh, it's a beautiful silver bowl, which is in my living room. And um, uh, I guess as I d did my work, I never really thought of myself as heroic or uh, having anything deserving of lifetime achievement. But um, I do think I uh, taught some lessons. Um, the, some of the points we've made on market research, on content marketing, uh, on um, you know how you do advertising right and not in a bad, unproductive way. Uh, I think I've contributed uh, some of those things to the profession. Um, the advertising is ephemeral. The speak like a diplomat is gone, although who knows, maybe it'll be revived someday. But I have taught the people at AWAI. I've spoken at several of their conferences. Um, I've written for their uh, online newsletters, and so I'm passing some of the things that I learned on to a younger generation. Mm -hmm. When I speak at AWAI's events in Delray Beach, Florida, there are these, you know, they can get 300 people there, and many of them are young, you know, they're kids in their 20s, maybe some of them are older and looking at a second career, and uh, I find that they do have, many of them do have a respect for people who came before them. They read Claude Hopkins. They read John Caples. They read Ogilvy, Gene Schwartz. They know who these people are. And so it's certainly true that the, the lessons of the print world are applicable online. The yeah. A-B testing is a good example. Yeah. But uh, it does make me sort of sad or furious that there are people who, I mean, they're doing everything online. They don't know or care that something came before them. And uh, I think the most successful people who enter advertising and marketing will have some respect for the past, for people who have gone before and who will know that really the fundamentals of human psychology don't change. They might change every billion years or so with evolution, but so much of what Gene Schwartz wrote, for example, uh, his book, Breakthrough Advertising, was a, a Bible for me and for so many other people. And so much of what made sense and worked back then before there was a single computer or maybe there were the computers that filled entire rooms. Uh, 
so much of that is still relevant today. Um, you know, find the benefit, find the pain point, um, understand people's concerns, what their problems are, how they think, how they buy. You know, that is as relevant online to website marketing, email marketing, apps, or what have you, mm. uh, as you know, it was back then. Yeah, and I know you know from the proudest accomplishments to low points, and we are talking about some of the low points. You're, we were talking about it, and there wasn't too much that came to mind, except for one thing when I was reading online was when your mentor passed away, and you actually gave uh, a eulogy, right? Well, yes, there was a, a gathering in um, uh, Aspen, uh, and uh, there was a tribute, many of the people who knew uh, Bob were there, and I probably told some of these same stories, the story of the gold coin uh, ad, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a sad uh, event, certainly for me. Um, we were never enormously close. Uh, personally, we lived in different cities. He had interests like sailing, which I don't much care about, uh, and uh, usually when we uh, got together, I mean, I'd go to his office and spend an entire day there, and we would just be talking about, you know, a stack of assignments he wanted me to write mm -hmm. for him. But uh, I certainly think back uh, on Bob with uh, great yeah. fondness yeah. and gratitude for everything he gave me. Yeah, what, what would you say your fondest memory is with, oh, gosh. with Bob? Uh, well, as I say, we weren't uh, all that close. I remember that conference I mentioned in London. That was his conference. And one day I was uh, having breakfast uh, in the hotel restaurant and he passed by and joined me and that may have been the first and only time we were just together alone and um, uh, we could talk about something other than business. I remember he told me he, he had been an accountant which may be why he understood the all of that stuff about taxpayers and accountants and uh, their advisors and the IRS and so forth. Uh, and he told me about his love of sailing and he wanted to circumnavigate the globe, which I don't think his time ever, you know, his busy schedule ever allowed him right. to do. And he sold this company, then became ill. Uh, I remember once I learned it, there would be a birthday celebration, so I found an old antique sextant, you know, that they used to do longitude or whatever, you know, packed in this beautiful wooden box. And his wife, Janet, shy, this was even before cell phone cameras, but she had the foresight to see, you know, to get a camera and uh, took some pictures as he uh, opened the, the package and then was even, you know, pretending to use it. But I, uh, I think he, he got a kick out of something that was related to his nautical yeah. interests. That's nice. Um, and Don, so I also want you to talk a little bit about the versatile freelancer. Tell us about it. How is it going to help uh, the viewers? Well, I did write this ebook for the my friends at AWAI, and it's based on this. I think if I had it to do all over again, I would choose a different name, and I would call it "Share What You Know and Get Paid for It." The idea is that we all possess knowledge and experience if we've been around for a while, and this can be redeployed to help others and you might even get paid for it. So I'm talking about things like consulting, corporate training where you go into a company and teach their staff, uh, public speaking, and even something I call critiques and evaluations and charging for that. And I did all these things throughout my career. There's nothing in the book that I didn't do. And there are all these opportunities and benefits. I found that doing them was fun and enjoyable. You learn a lot. You get out of your house if you're a reclusive freelancer. I originally wrote it for copywriters because that's AWAI's audience. But the more I got into it and wrote it, I realized it could help anyone, lawyers, doctors, architects, anyone who has a lifetime of experience that could benefit others. So uh, there is a website with a sales letter that I wrote myself. It's very simple to remember, versatile freelancer dot com. We'll link it up, yeah. And I think it's also, I hope, a good example of effective copywriting.
and the book has gotten very nice uh, reactions, positive ones for people who said this has helped me, I've made money with it, and I think personally, all biases aside, I think it deserves a wide readership, and I have some lessons, ideas, tips, recommendations that you don't see elsewhere, at least I didn't come across some of my points in my, um, in my research for the book. Uh, I can share one or two tips. Yeah, talk about a couple of tips from it, yeah. Well, one of them, which, again, this is one of those points that seems obvious, when you, but people just don't seem to realize it, and that is there are opportunities to speak everywhere. If you're in business, um, no matter where you are, as long as it's a fairly substantial city and not a country town, uh, there are going to be business groups that meet regularly, weekly, monthly, for breakfast, for lunch. There are annual conventions. Uh, there are conferences, seminars, webinars, all kinds of events where people get together to listen to presentations, to swap talk. I was just reading, um, there was something about uh, whether it was the book industry or computer industry or something, that they were cracking down on the people who don't pay, but they just schmooze in the hallways. Well, those, you know, aren't going to help you if you're giving a talk, but there are still a lot of people who will play by the rules and pay the price of admission because the networking comes with that. So uh, I found that it was, I spoke to newsletter people, publishers throughout my career. It was a captive audience, and I would always give helpful information, such as what we've been discussing here. But invariably, afterward, I would, six or 10 or 12 people would crowd around me and say, here's my business card, call me, what's your schedule like, when can you write a promotional package for me? And it's just the perfect uh, venue for generating business. And many or even most of my clients throughout my 30-year career came to me through that kind of speaking engagement. And there are other cases, some of these things you're not going to be paid a lot, but in other cases you will be paid. I was paid quite well for when I went into a company and spent a day, uh, sometimes two days, training their staff and how to write copy, uh, how to do marketing, uh, all of the, the lessons that I know. Yeah. And I found it was a nice break from just sitting at my desk and writing. Uh, so uh, the other technique, I'll pack, call it the shoebox tactic. Uh, some people might say, well, you know, this can't apply to me. What would I speak on? Uh, or it even applies to writing, uh, which is another way of generating business, generating clients. Uh, so the shoebox technique is you take a shoebox uh, and whenever you get an idea in the middle of the night or when you're doing and you just scribble it on a piece of paper and toss it into the box. And repeatedly, I was amazed when I wanted or needed to write an article or give a talk, I would go to the box. Really, I used a file, file folder, uh, but the shoebox is a nice metaphor. Uh, and I had forgotten all the things I had dropped into the box, and I had more than enough to do a presentation or to write an article for a trade mm -hmm. publication. Uh, you, you just don't remember everything you've done. But the flip side of it is that if you don't do that, if you don't create that habit, then you're going to forget them. And when it comes time, when somebody says, would you like to talk to our group? And you think, oh, this could be a great opportunity. But then you have to scramble for ideas because you weren't jotting them down all along. If there's anyone out there who has a photographic memory, then I apologize. And my rule doesn't apply to you. But I know in my case, I don't. And I think most people do not. So what was something memorable you remember pulling out of the shoebox? Oh, gosh, uh, you should have warned me about some of these uh, questions. Um, well, I had a um, uh, uh, something I was going to discuss later on uh, um, whether I disagreed with a client or whether they yeah. had certain fallacies, and, and this was probably one of the shoebox things. Well, all through my career from clients and from things I read, I would hear people don't buy for rational reasons they buy for emotional reasons or they buy on an emotional basis and then after the fact they justify it on the basis of of uh, of reason well i've always disagreed with this maybe part of it is i come from an ayn rand background of uh where reason is part of my own personal philosophy uh but i always thought there was something wrong with this idea i mean take for example the i mentioned at the beginning the um 
retirement letter, teaser copy, is Social Security doomed? Most people would say, ooh, this is a fear approach. This is 100% emotional. But maybe Social Security is doomed, in which case right. it's the, the headline is as much rational as it is emotional. So I'm sure at some point I must have jotted this down and put it in the file folder. And then later I wrote about it. I've spoken about it. Uh, and um, uh, I think it was um, – there was some uh, – uh, direct mail guru. I'm hesitant to say you his have name, to but he, names because I don't yeah. do any editing. So go ahead. yeah, yeah. Uh, but he actually wrote about this and said that I changed his thinking on this. And he, I heard him say, people buy for emotional reasons. And I, and I went up to him and said, I think there's a different way you can look at this. And then he later wrote an article and said, Don completely changed my thinking about this. So I think if you're looking for a moral here, I think the idea is that you know it's like the old Saturday Night Live routine it's a floor wax it's a dessert topping you're both right <laughs> uh so here it's it's people buy for both emotional and rational reasons and some and in many cases it's difficult to separate out all the elements uh i bought myself a year ago a beautiful new uh, flat screen TV and I certainly bought it I did a lot of research and did it for um, you know on the basis of all the pros and cons but also there was probably some element of emotion that it looks attractive or I can boast about it and you know although some people might say that those are kind of rational too so I always as I say I still see this fallacy and uh, I think it's one that could lead people in in a bad direction where they think, oh, we've got to make everything emotional. Sell the car on the basis of the new car smell because that's emotional rather than on the horsepower or all the, the technical specs. But I think, as I say, you can look at it at a, at a different and somewhat more balanced way. Yeah. Tom, there is a balance between the client copywriter relationship. What else have you disagreed with with, with clients? Well, yeah, there are a couple of these. I never put them all together into one article, but that, that would be a, an interesting idea. Another thing, which is kind of analogous to the emotional-rational dichotomy, is I, I heard from clients, we don't want to be negative. We want to be positive. Well, in fact, you can sell by being negative. You can use scare approaches for money promotions for things having to do with health. Uh, almost anything can take, and of course, everybody knows that one of the, the great rules is fear versus greed. Do you take the fear approach of a scare? Do you emphasize what you could lose? Or do you take the greed approach, which is positive, and there's a benefit to be gained? But, and very often, I would ask myself, should we take the fear or the greed approach? And sometimes we've actually tested them. And as I recall, very often when we've tested them, the fear, the negative approach won mm. uh, because it's motivating. And there have been all kinds of psychological tests that show, you know, when people play games in a laboratory, they will go to much greater lengths to protect what they already have right. rather than take a risk for a hypothetical gain. Right. Even if, you know, you're just playing for a uh, matches or small sums of money. So there are a lot of psychological factors here, but I was always amazed when people would say, oh, we don't want to be negative. And there was a third, a final example uh, that I found all the time uh, where the client, where I'd suggest some kind of concept or approach and the, um, uh, the client would say, we don't want to do that. Our readers, our customers are too smart for that. But, you know, this always puzzled me. Uh, first of all, you know, they were probably overestimating the intelligence of their audience. But also, I came up with a rule I called, a smart person in a hurry can act dumb. One of the people you interviewed told me when he cited this at a conference, uh, so one of his attendees said this was one of the most valuable things I learned. Uh, if people, if somebody has a genius IQ, but he's deciding, you know, what shoelaces to buy or something, you know, he's not going to spend a lot of time cogitating and he may make a decision on, you know, some um, relatively insignificant base. So you can't, you don't want a cerebral kind mm -hmm. of argument. And of course, it's been said that, you know, you could be Albert Einstein, but even he had, you know, a daily um, uh, tasks in which he, genius kinds of things weren't required. So if somebody is 
no one is going to give as much attention to your product or service as you are going to give. It's your whole life, but it's only a tiny part of the life of your customer or prospect. So you've got to get to them fast. You've got to communicate simply, uh, which is why even though I love big words, I try to keep them out of my copy. And I try to communicate on a simple, basic, human level with everyday language that people are going to understand. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, they're too smart for that is another fallacy. Yeah. So, so Don, I had another question. You know, we've talked about successes, um, and we also talked a little bit about some of the mistakes other people have made. What's some of the ones that that you've made? Well, uh, first, let me say that I've certainly made mistakes. I've had failures. Uh, I've had um, campaigns that didn't work, and where I was beaten by the other copywriter in the split test. But uh, one thing that's a problem or an obstacle is that there isn't always a lesson. Sometimes you don't know or you can only guess. But there was one one story that may hold a moral for your viewers. I was assigned to um, to write copy for a book. Really, it was like a loose leaf binder that you would buy for a large sum of money and then you'd get updates. And these were basically form, lezer, form letters for a small business. Uh, what to do when you have to collect an overdue debt? What do, you, what do you say when you have to fire someone? Well, just yesterday I checked online and you can find lots and lots of form letters free. But back then, this was 15, 20 years ago, uh, there was no internet with these uh, with, with this stuff. So uh, I did what I thought was a pretty good package on why you, Mr. or Miss Small Business Person, would uh, find this a useful product. It didn't work. And if I recall correctly, the publisher hired another copywriter. And that didn't, his package didn't work either. But a few weeks or months went by and I was chatting with someone, I don't remember who, and he, I told him the story and he suggested the line, the right letter can get you anything you want. And I thought, whoa, what a concept. If only I had thought of that. But I didn't think of it. By this time, the product had been aborted. It was never launched. And frankly, I don't know if that would have made a difference. It could have been the price point of this thing. It was like several hundred dollars, which may have been more than people wanted to pay for form letters. But that was an example of where I think he put his finger on the ultimate benefit. And uh, so it, um, I, I, there's always that thing about, you know, when you find that somebody has beaten you to it or comes up with a better idea and you think, why didn't I think of that? And maybe you would have if you had thought more, dug deeper. And so that was, was a lesson for me and perhaps some of the people watching. Yeah, yeah. Don, you've been incredibly generous for your time. So I have one last question for you. And what's one of the best things our viewers can do in their marketing to get immediate results? Well, this is a nice segue from the form letter story where I mentioned the ultimate benefit. Yeah. And I think that that's my lesson, where you dig for not just the letter will save you a few minutes, uh, but it could change your life or get you Get you, get you what you most want. So the idea is to identify your customer's most urgent needs and then offer him some solution, some benefit to his problem. We've talked about this quite a bit. And you may think you know what it is, but then if you dig deeper, you may find it's something else. And that, that often happens. There's something below the surface. And uh, somebody, it wasn't, I, I didn't come up with this, but somebody said years ago, to ask yourself, what's the single biggest promise you can make? Hmm. And so if you look for those things, the ultimate benefit, the biggest problems, you, you don't accept what's superficially on the surface, but you, you know, if, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example, but if, you know, you're, it's not just saving time or solving a business problem, but it's deeper into issues of pride and status and feelings of accomplishment. You're getting into uh, more serious psychological benefits than the everyday one that your product appears to solve. Yeah. Uh, and uh, years ago, they used to compile lists of human needs, uh, security, food, sex, um, status. And so, you know, you can, 
uh, you can learn something by studying these lists and maybe reading some books on human psychology. There are so many that, especially for business and marketers, that attempt to tell you what's under the surface. Uh, and it's, it's that digging, I think, that leads to the big successes, and that's the, the ultimate um, lesson I would leave your viewers with. Yeah, what's the single biggest promise you can make? Yeah. Don, I just want to be the first one to thank you so much. This has been super valuable. Everyone should check out the Versatile Freelancer and check out your works at AWAI. And uh, just thank you so much. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, great, Don. Thanks.